Hey, so we are continuing chapter 11. This is the second video. I'm starting on slide 11 of the PowerPoint that can be found in D2L or in the shared class files. Um, I introduced in the previous video the four intermolecular forces. Um, we're going to focus on the bottom three in this video, and specifically I'm going to start with dipole-dipole forces. I'm going to explain that one first, and then we'll move into the other ones. So with dipole-dipole forces, we're specifically talking about polar molecules. Okay, so in order to have dipole-dipole forces, you have to be comparing the force between two polar molecules. So in this picture, each molecule is a compound called acetonitrile. Uh, basically, it's CH3 right here, and then a carbon, and then a nitrogen. If we remember electronegativity, nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. So the bond between C and N is going to be shifted the, the electrons are going to be pulled towards the nitrogen so when we did that in 1211 in chapter 8 and 9 we would draw an arrow that's called a dipole where the arrow points towards the negative side and then we cross the back end so that where the arrow is pointing it has a partial negative charge so the partial negatives can be around the nitrogen and then we pulled electrons away from the carbons down here so there's going to be a partial positive on this side of the molecule so this is a polar molecule it has a dipole pointed towards the nitrogen. Every one of these molecules is going to have that same dipole. So essentially what's going to happen is the partial negative of the nitrogen of this molecule will be attracted to the partial positive on the carbon end of this molecule. So there's going to be attraction between those just based on the attraction of opposite charges. The stronger the partial charges that we have there, the stronger the attraction is between the two molecules. Okay. Well, each molecule can interact with several other molecules. So this would be one example of a dipole-dipole interaction. But then I have another one, the nitrogen of this molecule, attracted to the CH3 here. So that's going to be another example of a dipole-dipole interaction. And you can see there are multiple going on. The more of those there are and the stronger they are, that's going to affect the properties of a liquid. If they get strong enough, you could even turn it into a solid. Um, or it could make the liquid be a little bit more thick and viscous. Um, it could have a higher boiling point. There are lots of properties that can be affected that we'll talk about. So dipole-dipole forces, the name, it's the dipole of one molecule interacting with the dipole of a second molecule. We're always going to be looking at two molecules when you do this. If we ever ask you to draw an example of an intermolecular force, please keep in mind that if you don't draw two molecules, then you can't draw the force between them, okay? And we are talking about partial charges. Again, in my schematic here, if you're looking at it, um, it's a partial positive. That delta symbol represents a partial in this context. So partial positive, partial negative. Another example, any polar molecule would exhibit these forces. So an example is ICL. Um, and again, if you looked at ICL, if it didn't have these polar uh, interactions, then the melting point of that compound would be much lower. As it is, the melting point of this one is 97. Again, we're going to see different melting points as we go through the examples to see which ones are higher or lower than others. All right, so several ways we can increase the strength of the dipole-dipole forces. Uh, we can increase it by increasing the polarity of the molecule. If the molecules are more polar, that's going to give you a stronger partial positive or a stronger partial negative. That's going to increase the attraction. Or we can increase the size of the electron cloud, which will be an example on the next slide. So those are the two different things we can do to strengthen my dipole-dipole interactions. So this picture here, if you notice the molecular weight of these five compounds, the molecular weight for these is pretty close to the same. They're not exactly the same, but I would not say that size is a major difference here, okay? If we go the size of the molecule, if we go by the, the weight, okay? But if we actually do a calculation, in 1211, I don't ever have my students calculate the dipole moment, but there is an equation in the book. You can do a calculation to determine kind of how polar a molecule is. So if you calculate the dipole moment, what we see is that propane, which is just a hydrocarbon, it's essentially nonpolar. 
But if you calculate, the polarity is 0.1. That's a very small value, because again, I said it's nonpolar. But as I go down the list, acetonitrile is actually very polar. That nitrogen is extremely electronegative, so it pulls the uh, charge out. So there's a heavy shift in the uh, partial charges in the dipole. So that one's 3.9, that's a much higher value. So if these molecules are all about the same size, but then acetonitrile is much more polar, then if we look at their boiling points, you see that the nonpolar compound, its boiling point is 231 Kelvin, which is like negative 40 something uh, degrees Celsius. So basically propane boils at negative 40 something degrees Celsius, whereas acetonitrile boils at, that's like 82 degrees Celsius. So that's a pretty significant change for molecules that are all about the same size. All right, now, same idea. Now we're gonna look at size. If I look at the red line, these are three compounds that are all in the same group. So if I drew their Lewis dot structures, the Lewis dot structures of H2S, I'd have the sulfur with two hydrogens and then the sulfur has two lone pairs on it. Just beneath sulfur is selenium on the periodic table. So it, this Lewis dot structure is gonna look just like that one. The difference is selenium is a bigger, heavier atom in the middle. So basically H2SE is gonna be a larger molecule. The cloud of electrons is gonna be bigger than H2S. Okay, and then if I continue beneath H2S in the periodic table would be tellurium, so H2TE. All right, so what we notice is there's a pretty steady pattern where the boiling point of H2S is about negative 60. The boiling point of H2SE is maybe negative 50 or so, or negative 40 something. And then H2TE, the boiling point's pretty close to zero, just under zero. So there's a steady trend where as I increase the size of the molecules, their structure is very similar, but I see that the boiling point goes up. If I look at group four, because this one's group six, if I look at group four, I'm gonna see a similar trend. Okay, CH4, and then silicon, and then germanium, and then tin. Those four elements are in the same group. So again, the structure is similar. As I go down the periodic table, the atoms get bigger, and I notice that there's a pretty steady trend of increasing boiling points. Okay, so for polar molecules or nonpolar molecules, as I increase the weight, the boiling point's gonna go up. But there is an exception. On group six, I originally showed you H2S, H2SE, H2TE. If water behaved like the other ones did, I would expect H2O, just follow the same pattern, the boiling point of H2O ought to be around right here. So it ought to be about negative 70 or 80 degrees Celsius, but it's not. It's not just a little bit off, it's way off. Water should be here, but its boiling point's actually way up there. That is crucial for life on Earth because if the boiling point of water was negative 70 something degrees Celsius, then the temperature of the Earth is way above that. There'd be no water on Earth in liquid form. It'd all be gaseous in the atmosphere or it might escape into space. So that's kind of a big deal. Why does water behave so differently? Well, if it's not following the same pattern as all the other molecules, which this is a polar molecule, this is a polar molecule, this is a polar molecule, there must be something unique or significant going on there, okay? And actually, if I look at more of these trends, what I notice is group four works perfectly. Group five, pH three, ASH three, SVH three, it also does pretty well, but I notice that ammonia is not following the trend. And then for group seven, same idea where HF is not following the trend. So essentially what I found is three elements tend to be exceptions to the normal behavior of polar molecules. Molecules that involve nitrogen, hydrogen, excuse me, nitrogen, fluorine, and oxygen, which just happen to be the three most electronegative elements on the periodic table, those molecules in some cases have extremely high boiling points compared to all the other, thing, all the other uh, molecules that are similar in their structure. Now, why is this? Well, if it's the three most electronegative elements and it happens to be molecules where those, those elements 
are directly connected to hydrogen, what's going on is that when you connect hydrogen to one of those, the bond is going to be so much more polar than other polar bonds that we're going to have to break them into a, a whole separate category. So molecules that have nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, and if they're directly connected to hydrogen, we're going to have to put them into a new class of intermolecular forces that we're going to call hydrogen bonding. So again, if you look back at our list of the four intermolecular forces, this is number two. Hydrogen bonding is number two. Dip regular dipole-dipole forces were number three. So we've split them off in a whole new category. But specifically, if we look at the structure of a molecule, again, you have to be able to draw the Lewis dot structure. You have to look and see, is a hydrogen directly connected to the oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen? If that happens, and you have to have a lone pair, there are cases where nitrogen will actually make four bonds instead of three bonds, and if it does that, it can't do hydrogen bonding anymore. Um, but that's kind of a weird case that you won't really see until organic chemistry. Excuse me. But um, if you have an OH bond, an NH bond, or a FH bond, in any of those, you're going to get a really strong dipole-dipole force that doesn't follow the pattern of everybody else. It's going to be a lot stronger, so we're going to put it in that category. So it's an extremely strong partial positive charge on the hydrogen, which is going to attract the lone pair of the electronegative atom, which would be fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. And those are hydrogen bonds. Okay. Now, if I look at this molecule, again, on a quiz or test, I'll see students, uh, if I say label a hydrogen bond, they'll look and say, oh, there's an NH bond. That's a hydrogen bond. It's like, no, that's not it. That's a molecule, that's ammonia. The bond between nitrogen and hydrogen, those are covalent bonds. Those are intramolecular, they're within one molecule. You have to remember to draw a hydrogen bond, which is a, a intermolecular force, it's the force between two molecules. So from the nitrogen that's electronegative to the hydrogen in this water molecule, the hydrogen's partial positive, there's an attraction between those, so that's my hydrogen bond right there in between. Okay, so you have to label those correctly. Now, hydrogen bonding is one of those, it's kind of a buzzword that comes up a lot. You know, if you're taking a biology class and they're saying what kind of force um, causes proteins to fold into the shapes that they get um, and all that kind of stuff, probably the most common answer that comes up is gonna be hydrogen bonding. Um, so just, this is an important one for you to remember for other classes. Another drawing, if I have just a sample of water, the hydrogen bond, basically this is a regular OH covalent bond. The dotted line is how we usually represent the hydrogen bond. It's just showing us that, hey, there's an attractive force between these um, and that it's strong enough that we're gonna give it the name hydrogen bond. All right, finally, our fourth intermolecular force, the one that's at the bottom of the chart, called London forces or dispersion forces. Essentially, what we're looking at here, these are going to be nonpolar atoms or nonpolar molecules. Okay, so if I have two atoms, atom A and atom B, uh, the electrons are flying around the atoms and they're pretty evenly spaced around uh, the, the cloud of electrons around the at nucleus. Uh, is evenly distributed, so there's really no charge on one side or the other normally. But every once in a while, and electrons are always flying around, every once in a while what I'm going to have, if I look at atom B right here, the electrons, and let's just say uh, it's a helium atom or whatever because it's only showing two electrons, the two electrons might just find themselves as they're randomly flying around, they're both on the same side of the atom. And when they're both on the same side of the atom, it means that that side of the atom is going to behave as if it's negatively charged. So we're going to call it a partial negative charge on that side. And then on the back side, there aren't as many electrons. So relatively, that side is going to be more positive. Okay, so that is called a polarized atom. It only happens for a split second. And we're talking like, you know, electrons move fast. We're talking like nanoseconds or picoseconds where you're going to form a dipole in a helium atom for just a split second. So that's called an instantaneous dipole. 
It just happens randomly when more electrons end up on one side of the atom than the other. But it has an effect. That formation of a dipole right here is going to affect the other atom that's nearby. Because what will happen is the negative charge right here, where there's too many electrons on this side, it's going to repel the electrons right here and push them to the other side too. So when those electrons get pushed over, now this molecule, this atom, is going to become shifted. So that's called an induced dipole. This, the second dipole is formed because of its interaction with the first one. The fact that they're close enough, that the shift in charge here caused a shift over here. Once we have two polar atoms, now there's going to be an attraction between them. So I now have an intermolecular force that's going to be a very brief attraction between the atoms based on the shift of the electrons. Now, let's remember though, in a helium atom, the electrons are flying around randomly. So even if I get them shifted to one side for a, a split second, give it another split second and they're going to go back to where they were. So this interaction is very limited, it's very short term, it's not very strong. The attraction between nonpolar atoms and molecules is going to be pretty weak because this is never going to be a really dominating force that occurs. Okay, but there's some key words that we need to know. We're forming an instantaneous dipole um, where the electrons just happen all fall to one side of an atom. And then that interaction with another atom can create an induced dipole. Make sure you know those words. And then finally, the ability of an atom to shift like that is referred to as the word polarizability. It's how easily an atom can be shifted in its electron cloud. Okay, now all molecules can do this. Whether a molecule is, is polar or nonpolar, the electrons are still gonna be shifting either way. So all molecules can be polarizable. All molecules can exist London forces or dispersion forces, okay? So if you're ever given a, a, an ionic compound, it can have London forces in it. If you have um, water, H2O, it has London forces in it. It also has hydrogen bonding, and we're usually going to focus on the one that's more important. We're going to focus on the most significant force. So if I asked you what type of forces exist in water, one of the answers is hydrogen bonding, but another answer is London forces. Both are occurring in between water molecules, but our main focus is going to be on the hydrogen bonding because that's going to be the most significant force present. Okay? So basically, London forces are going to be most important for molecules that don't have anything stronger. We're always going to focus on the strongest force. So if I have a nonpolar molecule, it won't have hydrogen bonding, it won't have dipole-dipole forces, so the strongest force that it has will be London forces, and that means if that's the strongest thing I have, then that's what I'm going to focus on. So for nonpolar molecules, London forces are their best attraction. So if we compare, just to reiterate, noble gases, which noble gases, single atoms, there's no polarity to those atoms normally, but as they get bigger, neon is pretty small, it has a pretty low boiling point. As the atom gets bigger, the electron cloud gets bigger, the electron cloud becomes a little bit more polarizable, the strength of the interactions gets stronger, and that's why the boiling points go up. So xenon has a much higher boiling point than any of the other noble gases that are shown. <clears throat> now, we've talked about how polar the molecules are. We've talked about the size of the molecules. There's one more factor that we can talk about, and that's gonna be the shape of the molecules, okay? So if I look at their uh, two different structures that can be drawn from the formula C5H12, Essentially, I can draw the five carbons straight out in a line, carbon one, two, three, four, five, and put all the hydrogens around them. Or I can draw the molecule another way, neopentane, where I have one carbon in the middle connected to four carbons around it, and then all four carbons around it have three hydrogens on them. Either way, I get the same formula, C5H12, 
but one of them is going to be like long and skinny. The other one's going to be kind of a blob or like more like a ball. Okay. Now, both, if I look at C5H12, one thing to kind of remember, hydrocarbons are always nonpolar. Okay. So both molecules are hydrocarbons. Both are nonpolar. So you think, well, if they have the same formula, so they have the same weight, they're both nonpolar, they probably have the same properties, and that's not true. The shape does have an effect. If I lay two of these molecules, pentane, which is the straight long one, if I lay two of them on top of each other, the more that their electron clouds can inter interact with each other as they lay on top, they can interact all the way down in between them. In order to separate those molecules, which I want to go from liquid state to the gaseous state, I'm essentially just moving the molecules away, letting them fly around. If I want to separate them, I have to break the interaction all the way down. That's a lot of surface area that's in contact. So it's kind of like if I have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to peel off the top piece of bread, you got all that stuff in the middle that's making them stick together. You have to kind of pull pretty hard to do that. Okay. On the other hand, <coughs> neopentane is more like a ball. If I take two balls and bring them together, the actual contact between the two balls would only be a very small point of contact right here and the less contact there is between the surfaces or the electron clouds, the easier it is to pull them apart. Okay, so basically the lesson here is that a longer molecule is going to have more interaction than a globular or balled up molecule. And the one that has more interaction is going to have higher or stronger intermolecular forces, which is going to give it a higher boiling point or melting point. So, comparing the boiling point of pentane is 309 Kelvin, the boiling point of neopentane is 282, so you can see that's 27 degree difference in their boiling points. That is a significant difference. So, we've given you a lot of information, now we need to say, okay, what can we do with it? Well, essentially, we're going to start in the next video, we want to start comparing the molecules so that we can decide, if you have a group of molecules, can you look and tell me which ones are going to have low boiling points or melting points? Which ones are going to have higher boiling points or melting points? Can you predict what physical state they're going to be in? That kind of thing. So, when we apply our rules, the first thing you're going to do when you want to determine the properties of a molecule, you're going to look at the structure and decide, okay, what kind of inter intermolecular force do I have? If it's a polar molecule, I might have dipole-dipole forces. If it's a polar molecule that has like an, an OH bond in it, then it moves up into the hydrogen bonding category. Okay, that's going to be the primary determinant of its properties, is what type of intermolecular force I have. If I have two molecules that both have the same intermolecular force, like I have two, two polar molecules, and I want to know which one's going to have a higher melting point, then I would go to number two, which is I'm going to look at the size. Whichever one has a bigger molecular weight is probably going to have the higher melting point and boiling point. Assuming that the, the, if they have the same intermolecular force, then I look at the size as a tiebreaker. Okay, if I look at the size and they're still pretty close to the same size, then only in that case, if they're the same type of intermolecular force, they're about the same size, then I would look at the, the structure of the molecule. If it has branching, that's like neopentane, where the carbons come out in every direction, makes it more like a ball, versus a long skinny molecule where there's no branching. Um, that would be my tiebreaker there, okay? So th these are my levels I would go through. I always try to make my decision based on the first level. I only go to the next level if it's a tie, okay? So I'm going to cut off the video. We'll pick up the next one and do some examples.